Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are talking about Tesla's newest annual impact report. They have just published that today. Always some really cool information in that, so we'll go through the highlights. We've also got a report on Giga Shanghai, some news on a nickel contract, and price changes in Canada. Quick look at the markets. The Nasdaq today continuing its downtrend, finishing at a new 52-week low close, down 1.4%, while Tesla did outperform slightly but still down 9 tenths of a percent to close at $865.65. Tesla is now trading at 76 times Q1's earnings annualized. All right, jumping right into the report on Giga Shanghai, this comes from Reuters. They are saying that Tesla is aiming to increase output at Shanghai to 2,600 cars per day from May 16th, citing an internal memo seen by Reuters. They also say that the memo says that this would be accomplished by going from the current one shift to two shifts. Previously, before the COVID lockdowns, Shanghai was doing about 2,200 vehicles per day on average, but that doesn't necessarily account for downtime. And we also don't know how much that is considered when it comes to this number. They could just be referring to peak daily rates rather than a figure that is sustained every single day. However, even factoring in downtime, this should put Tesla back to pretty close to the full levels of production from before the shutdown, with the possibility of production even exceeding those levels. Just to run through a quick hypothetical for some context, if we did see production at 2600 per day for June, let's say, sure, maybe there's some downtime, but maybe Tesla is also able to push production levels a little bit further by that point in time. 2,600 per day would be 78,000 vehicles produced, which would be 10,000 more than the record from January. I think that's actually pretty reasonable given the context from the Q1 earnings call when Elon said that for Q2, they're going to do everything they can to push back to Q1 levels of production despite the downtime. So they're definitely going to need to make up ground in June. If they were able to hit that production rate for the second half of May, that could potentially push the second quarter output to 150,000 vehicles from Shanghai. So even with that record production rate for the second half of the quarter, that would still be down 16% from the first quarter, just talking Shanghai individually, and that would leave 155,000 vehicles that would have to be produced at the other factories to get Q2 levels of production back to Q1. Fremont's been doing about 125,000. I think that could pretty easily push up to 130,000 this quarter. Then you'd be left with 25,000 from Austin and Berlin. I think that's a bit of a stretch for those two factories this quarter. So to get back to Q1 production levels, Tesla would probably have to push Fremont a little bit further or ramp up Shanghai in June beyond what we're seeing in this report. It's not off the table, but I'm not particularly bullish about that happening at this point in time, but I'm also completely fine with that because clearly Tesla is going to be setting up for a very, very strong third quarter, and the reasons for a constrained second quarter are extremely clear. Now, if Tesla can actually somehow pull this off and get Q2 production close to Q1 levels, that would be extremely exciting because that would either mean that Berlin or Texas is ramping up really fast, or Shanghai's run rate in June, and therefore at the end of the quarter leading into Q3, would be way higher than what people think is possible, or Fremont's output increased, which has been flat for a couple of quarters. If any of those things or some combination of those things were to happen, that would be a positive surprise towards Q3. Doesn't feel like that long ago that we were talking about how exciting Q3 2021 was going to be. You guys know I love my Q3s, and barring any number of unforeseen circumstances, which at this point we're all too familiar with, looks like we're setting up for another really exciting Q3 this year. All right, next we've got a quick update also from Reuters that Tesla and Vale have finally signed a long-term nickel supply agreement. As we have previously talked about on a couple of different occasions, a deal has been in discussions for a number of years now. So it's good to see that finally coming to fruition. I don't really have much else to say though because unfortunately there are no details on the structure of the deal. But given that Vale is usually the number one or number two nickel producing company in the world, should be a pretty sizable deal. Next, we've got a quick update on Tesla vehicle prices in Canada. Yesterday, they made changes to all of their vehicles, with prices increasing anywhere from 600 to 3000 Canadian dollars, and the price of the FSD option also increasing $2,200. So the vehicle prices, some of that may just be foreign exchange adjustment, and then FSD as Tesla is now starting to roll out FSD beta. It's probably the reason for the price increase there. Speaking of FSD, we did get an update from Elon today on the status of the next FSD beta version. Remember, that was supposed to come out this week. Elon noting that the next release, 10.12, is another step towards all neural networks using surround video and reconciling output to a unified vector space for control code. It improves complex intersections and heavy traffic. It includes many upgrades to core code, so taking longer to debug issues, probably a Wednesday or Thursday release. So definitely excited for this one. It's been a while since 10.11 came out, and it sounds like some significant updates for 10.12. All right, now let's get into this impact report. So Tesla is now on the third or fourth year of filing these impact reports. They're always extremely interesting to look through. I definitely recommend reading through it, but it is 144 pages. So if you don't have time, we'll hit the highlights here. So right off the bat, Tesla talks about their goals. They do reiterate that their target for 2030 is still 20 million vehicles produced per year with an additional 1500 gigawatt hours or one and a half terawatt hours of battery production for energy storage. 
Those are the same numbers that were in the document last year, but always nice to see them reiterated. Another couple of quick slides that I always like to see are these pie chart breakdowns of worldwide emissions, and Tesla highlights the Tesla-related sectors of electricity and heat production, as well as transportation, and those are responsible for about 50% of global emissions, and almost two-thirds of emissions in the United States, so it's really nice to reinforce just how big of a difference that Tesla has the potential to make here, and it's also a good reminder for how big the addressable market is for Tesla. Following up with that, Tesla walks through how they're addressing these emissions challenges with their entire product ecosystem. This is what we really focused in on last year with the impact report was how Tesla is using increased utilization of these products through software like Autobitter and FSD, potentially multiplying the impact that each product can have on emissions through software. So I think that's a huge and underappreciated aspect of what Tesla is building here that's going to become more realized over time. But since we talked about that in depth last year, I'll just refer you to that video if you want to go through those points again. Looking at some of the new information this year, Tesla had some pretty interesting details about their workforce, starting off with the number of applicants that they received for jobs this year. It was over 3 million. That's up about 30% from 2020's roughly 2.3 million applicants and up about four times the number of applicants in 2019. Tesla's workforce in 2021 grew to almost 100,000 people. Elon recently said that that was about 110,000 right now. So depending on what turnover is, maybe Tesla was hiring, I don't know, 50,000 people a year or so from those 3 million applications. So maybe about 1.5% or so of applicants end up hired. The impact report also notes, as we have discussed in the past, that SpaceX and Tesla rate number one and number two respectively as the top choice for graduate engineers, according to Universum's research. Point being, Tesla's access to talent is very difficult to compete with. Another workforce-related item that Tesla points out that is worth remembering, Tesla says that their manufacturing jobs in the United States paid an average of $21.60 per hour, plus numerous benefits that we'll see on a slide here in a second, but that is 23% above the median, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, for production associates and assemblers in the U.S. That's also before a nice list of benefits, which of course includes stock compensation. Tesla this year has also added 401k contribution matching, and in 2021, they said that they expanded a safety net program and health insurance offering that includes travel and lodging support for those who may need to seek healthcare services that are unavailable in their home state. Definitely glad to see that from Tesla. Tesla also points out that their reviews on Glassdoor for employee satisfaction have become more positive over the last couple of years as the company has been a little bit more successful and more stable following the Model 3 ramp. Tesla does say that, quote, there's still a lot of work to be done predominantly when it comes to work-life balance. Our goals have always been and still are bold. Expectations are understandably high as a result, end quote. Last couple of quick things on the workforce then. Tesla does also note that the number of injuries per vehicle produced has again declined in 2021, down to 2.9 injuries per 1,000 vehicles. That's about a third of what it was back in 2018. Tesla this year does say that this will be the last year that they present this information. It's based on OSHA standards and they are going to convert over to ASTM, which is the American Society for Testing and Materials, standard E2920-19. In pretty typical Tesla fashion, they say that they made this change in response to studies indicating the statistical invalidity of previous metrics as measures of safety outcomes. This doesn't appear to be Tesla just trying to report a better number as they show that their global serious injury rate in 2021 did increase above 2020's level. Carrying safety over into vehicles, we've got some pretty interesting stuff here because of the safety score. Tesla has published a chart here showing what they have talked about on earnings calls, that the collision rate per million miles traveled decreases as safety score increases. Unfortunately, Tesla did not label the x-axis, but I'm assuming that it is linear here. So if it is linear, we can still tell the relative difference. Just gotta count some pixels in Photoshop, but the chart then does imply that if the safety score falls between 91 and 100, the collision rate is 23% lower than safety scores that fall between 81 and 90. Going down that chart, the top bucket would be a 46% lower collision rate than the 71 to 80 score, 60% lower than a safety score between 61 and 70, and 68% lower than a score 60 or below. So as Tesla has said, monitoring the safety score can encourage good, safe behavior that can reduce risk. That helps not only Tesla drivers, but everybody else on the road as well. Oh, and just happens to give Tesla some really, really valuable data for Tesla insurance. Tesla also highlights the capability of their active safety features. We've talked about this with the Euro NCAP testing. Not all active safety features are created the same, and Tesla's active safety features in those tests get a much higher score. But probably the most interesting part here is that Tesla says that, quote, after the introduction of Tesla Vision, a vision-only system that excludes radar, 
Our active safety ratings with IIHS improved. Pedestrian automatic emergency braking performance of our Tesla Vision was over 45% better than performance of Vision plus radar. End quote. So Tesla has faced a fair amount of skepticism for that decision, but that is definitely an encouraging statistic. There's also a really cool slide in here explaining a little bit more information on something we've heard Tesla talk about in a couple of safety videos they've published to YouTube, and that's using the richness of the data that they are able to collect to analyze real-world crash data to help make future accidents even more safe. Tesla says, quote, Our algorithm uses vehicle sensor data and within tens of milliseconds of impact determines what type of impact has occurred and triggers the seatbelt pretensioners and airbags to respond in the most optimal way down to the millimeter and mile per hour. Tesla engineers are also in the final stages of evaluating a system which uses autopilot to identify when a crash is imminent. This gives Tesla vehicles an uncanny ability to predict potential collisions and respond faster to an impact when it does occur, end quote. So we knew Tesla was using that real-world crash data. That alone is really exciting, but hearing that Tesla is now in the final stages of using the autopilot suite to also make crashes safer is really exciting. Later on, Tesla also says that where possible, they are sharing this data with regulators and other research organizations to help make things safer for others too. So a lot of really interesting stuff in there on safety, and then of course, environmental impact as well. I had to kind of laugh at one of the things Tesla included in here. They write that in 2021, we generated almost one and a half billion dollars in revenue selling zero emission regulatory credits to other OEMs. Proceeds from such will go towards building new factories to produce EVs that will continue to displace ICE vehicles. Of course, that's been happening for years, but nice to see that perfectly phrased from Tesla. One of my favorite diagrams in this entire report is Tesla's energy produced versus energy consumed. Since 2012, Tesla solar panels have produced just over 25 terawatt hours of energy, 25.39 terawatt hours to be precise, while Tesla's vehicles, all their energy used for charging, plus all the energy used at their factories, have consumed 25.27 terawatt hours. So more production from Tesla solar panels than vehicles and factories have consumed. Now, I was kind of curious on this. I looked back and last year Tesla had produced about 20.8 terawatt hours of energy from solar. So they added about four and a half terawatt hours in 2021 to that total production number. And then in their 2018 impact report, Tesla also showed the Model S, X, and 3 energy consumption, and that was 2.3 terawatt hours. That didn't include energy consumed from factories, but the current number that probably has two terawatt hours or so from factories, which means in 2019, 2020, and 2021, Tesla probably added about 18 terawatt hours of energy consumed by vehicles. So that's an average of about six terawatt hours per year. And obviously that's gonna be back heavy as the fleet grows. So point being, which this graph from 2018 alludes to, if Tesla doesn't do a little bit more work on solar here, the factory and vehicle consumption is going to quickly start to outpace Tesla solar production. Tesla does say that they are striving to always remain a net contributor to renewable energy generation. Still, even if that graph does flip for a little bit, obviously more electric vehicles still doing a lot to help with emissions in general. Tesla notes that even considering the manufacturing phase and a grid that isn't always perfect, a Model 3 and Model Y vehicle have a lower lifetime emissions than an equivalent ICE after just 6,500 miles driven. Tesla, of course, then shows a few of these lifetime emissions breakdowns, which we've seen for, I think, three years in this report now. So we won't spend a ton of time on these charts as we've talked about them before, but it shows, including the manufacturing phase, how much lower emissions are for the Model 3 and Model Y than an average premium ICE vehicle over the lifetime, and then especially how much lower they can be later on if they're solar charged or if they're robotaxis or ultimately both. And by the way, the manufacturing phase for the solar charged versions on this graph that includes the calculation for emissions for manufacturing both solar panels and Powerwall. In the appendix, Tesla also puts this data in a table, which I think makes it a little bit easier to understand. Ultimately, a ride-sharing use solar charge Model 3 would emit 29 grams of CO2 per mile over its lifetime. That would be a 94% reduction in emissions from a premium ICE vehicle. You can also see here some of Tesla's assumptions for a ride-sharing Model 3. Because they have the manufacturing phase for a grid charged ride sharing Model 3 as 10 grams of CO2 per mile versus a personal use Model 3 at 51 grams of CO2 per mile, even though the total manufacturing emissions would be the same for both of those cases. So Tesla's saying there that they would expect the ride sharing Model 3 to go about five times as many miles, which, if we assume 200,000 for the personal use one, shows Tesla expects that those ride sharing Model 3s would be 1 million miles. We also get a little bit of a hint here on Tesla's plans for the dedicated robotaxi. They say that, quote, it is also reasonable to assume that our high mileage products, such as our future Tesla robotaxis, will be designed for maximum energy efficiency as handling, acceleration, and top speed become less relevant. 
end quote. So Elon had already hinted to that at the Cyber Rodeo, but efficiency is going to be the name of the game for the dedicated robot taxi. Next, just a couple of quick interesting things on Tesla's factories. They point out that the kilowatt hours of energy consumed per vehicle produced at Shanghai is 17% lower than Fremont. They expect to continue to be able to improve on that. And they also note that all of their new factories are designed to be covered with solar panels on the roof. One really interesting tidbit here about the factory design, they also say that they are leveraging six years of sensor data from Giga Nevada to train AI to safely control 195 interconnected HVAC units. They say that in its first full year of operations, they have measured significant load reduction compared to baseline usage. Quote, AI control is expected to achieve significant energy savings for Tesla as it is scaled up to control a majority share of HVAC equipment at Giga Nevada, as well as HVAC equipment at other Giga factories. End quote. So while Tesla may not be doing HVAC stuff in the consumer space yet, clearly they are working on it in the factories and as usual, leveraging software in that. As for water usage, we've talked about this. It's been in previous impact reports, but Tesla again showing here how Gigafactory Texas and Gigafactory Berlin will both be among the lowest in terms of water consumption in the automotive space with Giga Berlin hopefully taking that top spot once it is fully ramped up. Even before then, Tesla's water consumption has been lower than everyone with the exception of BMW. All right, last couple of tidbits here then. Tesla publishes their supercharger uptime in this impact report every year. And although it looks like there's some variance year over year, you got to look at the scale here. It runs from 99% to 100%. Tesla's uptime for superchargers in 2021 was 99.96%. Tesla says, quote, we're aware that the chart showing supercharger uptime looks silly, but that's kind of the point, end quote. Tesla also threw in an interesting little note here on energy storage. They say that the four gigawatt hours worth of energy storage products that Tesla installed in 2021 was more than 15% of the 25 gigawatt hour global market. So obviously Tesla has been very constrained in that business, but still a significant share, which Tesla expects to either maintain or grow. Last couple of things then on recycling, pretty similar to the numbers that we had walked through last year. Tesla walks through the recovery of the materials that they get for each step, ultimately ending with 92%. That is the same percentage as last year. And then they also note that they recycled about 2,000 tons of nickel, copper, and cobalt in the year. If we bring in the 2020 numbers on this page for context, they do look pretty similar. Tesla in 2021 recycled 200 more tons of nickel, 120 more tons of cobalt, but 100 fewer tons of copper. Tesla did note, however, that by the end of the year, the recycling facility that they have in Giga Nevada did achieve a production rate of over 50 tons of recycled material per week. So even if that rate does not increase throughout 2022, Tesla could see a much bigger jump this year for recycled materials. All right, so that concludes with the highlights. Again, I would definitely recommend reading through the impact report. It's not that difficult of a read. Lots of nice pictures. But that is where we'll wrap it up for today and for the week. So I hope everybody has a great weekend. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you on Monday for the Monday, May 9th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you. Thank you.